everyone, and welcome back to Clothesline Retro, the wrestling podcast that talked about the yesteryears of professional wrestling through the eyes of two Israeli guys from Israel and a fellow wrestling pre- <laughs> wrestling uh, fan from Germany right now, right? That's true. But originally from Texas. Texas. <laughs> All right, I'm Oren Trayton. With me, as always, is Gordon. And now our newest addition to the cast, Oliver Cove. How are you doing, my friend? Very well. How about you guys? I'm good. How are you doing, Gordon? I should say he's the most welcome addition. Of course. Because, the you know, like the uh, the amount of information this guy brings along, like it's, 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 it couldn't be, it couldn't be used in a, in a, in a single ship. We got to bring more to the fleet with, with this kind of information. And that's why I'm saying that he's a most welcome addition and a longtime friend. Well, thank you very much. Plus, you should really tell people that usually you call me a fountain of misinformation. <laughs> well, <laughs> that too, right? Okay. Yeah. All just right. Gonna... So today's agenda, we are going to talk about SummerSlam 1988, the very first edition of SummerSlam that hailed from Madison Square Garden. And here's a little story about it, because as you all know, there's an old phrase concerning specific pay-per-views in the World Wrestling Federation. It was called the Big Four. You have WrestleMania, you have Survivor Series, you have the Rumble, and you have SummerSlam. And sometimes and we have a phone over. dropping with no flashlight. Hang on. <laughs> and you had people asking themselves, what came first? Now, usually people think about SummerSlam as the second biggest pay-per-view, but actually when you look at the Big Four, he was the fourth pay-per-view to be, to be added. You could say Rumble, but it did have a special television presentation in 88. But the pay-per-view came in 89, so this is actually, this is the fourth uh, uh, installment of the big four pay-per-views. And the reasoning behind it was, the first WrestleMania was, of course, WrestleMania. The second one, Survivor Series, was a direct competition with Clash of Champions, or Starcade, no, Starcade. The Royal Rumble uh, special uh, presentation on television was to compete against Bunkhouse Stampede. And SummerSlam was just, hey, it's summertime, let's just do another pay-per-view. Did you know there was a precursor to that in 1987? Really? There was SummerSlam a battle... or Rumble? SummerSlam. There was a, SummerSlam, a, I had no idea. There was a Battle Royal on Superstars of Wrestling, I think in July or August. Sometime around that time. And, and the commentators called it SummerSlam. Really? Like that Battle Royal on Superstars. And it really confused me because I didn't understand really? what SummerSlam was. Which one was it? I'm, a, I'm an avid Battle Royal collector. Which Battle Royal was it? Yeah, I have no Remember there... the winner? It was featured in the year in, year in review 1987. So that's the one with Superstars. Bigelow as the winner. I bel- I'm not sure. I, I would have to rewatch that. Bigelow as the winner. I think it was um, five men battle royal, and I think it was Bigelow um, winning it all, eliminating um, Bob Orton and Hercules. There you go. See, that's that's yeah. why you are the, the man with the brain. Yeah, I, I'm the heavily disturbed person and he's the one from abroad so i'm sorry did you say a five-man battle royal i believe so <laughs> why, hey. why are you wasting our time why why five-man battle royal what happened next excuse ten? me why why was the um heart vader austin undertaker basically a four-man battle royal why no no it? no but they, they had a storyline going to it like a final four that makes sense Perhaps but the, what if this one had a storyline as well did it have a storyline did it have a storyline gordon I, don't I, think, uh, I think Gordon. I, I don't know. I don't know. Like I, I do remember from the year in review 1987 that they had Bam Bam Bigelow throw out two guys from a battle royal. That's right. I think that was the one. Right. Okay. It's so no. he brought the SummerSlam fact along. I brought the personalities, <laughs> and Owen brought the podcast basically. I brought the, stage, the, the grand stage. I brought the editing tools. All right. So, um, first off, this is actually the, was my first time viewing the entire event. A couple of surprises we're going to talk about later on. But as always, Oliver, this was also your pick. You chose uh, SummerSlam 88. Why did you choose specifically this event? Well, I, I think that had two reasons. Number one, I was a big Macho Man fan of the whole storyline with him and Hulk Hogan as the mega powers and kind of, how it kind of devolved from WrestleMania 4 to WrestleMania 5. That kind of kicked off at SummerSlam. Like the whole storyline towards having Randy Savage turn on Hulk Hogan. You know, the stairs that Savage shot Hogan when he kind of touched Elizabeth, all that sort of stuff. Um, and obviously, the Ultimate Warrior defeating the Honky Tonk Man. Like, it, it's one of the most iconic matches, I think, in SummerSlam history. It wasn't one, one of the shortest. 
Which was a good thing. <laughs> Which it was. Yeah. Yeah. Gordon, Gordon, any early thoughts for SummerSlam 88? Um, Not too much. Frankly, SummerSlam probably told this already. But SummerSlam is one of my least favorite um, pay-per-views because it has no special matches or anything to draw you in. It's like we're having another pay-per-view, so come on in and watch it and order it or whatever. But, okay, some of the SummerSlam matches were... Um, acceptable at the very least and uh, some were great i'm sorry but undertaker versus undertaker is a wrestling classic you will not <laughs> no, i'm just kidding but come, you had bret hart and owen in the cage match in 94 that's which classic. i've never watched never what? watched it what do you mean I never watched it i can't stand cage matches but it's I... one of the greatest cage matches ever and still uh, reality survived without you, you, can, you can you can't judge a match without watching it i mean i'm sorry man you gotta you got watch it Oliver, what's your, what's your thoughts? Stand cage matches. That's all. That's all there's to it. Oliver, your thoughts for SummerSlam as a cage match, but Harvard's zone. Oliver's in shock. I just froze, I think. Like, yeah, I you froze, but it's good. You're like still with us. Yeah, you were. You were. Um, your thoughts on Bread versus Zoe in SummerSlam 94 cage match? I hated the match. Really? I, I literally asked Dave Meltzer if he was out of his mind when he gave it five stars. Yeah, I'm guessing, yeah. But uh, I think it's down to my my not enjoying Brett and Owen very much in the ring together. Wow! I just I don't know. Like the brother well, versus brother I, I thing is great. If you say this, if you say this, did you like their uh, WrestleMania ten encounter? I thought it was okay, but not, nothing more than that. And I th I know yeah. I'm completely out to lunch on this one. I know mm -hmm. that it's just personal preference. I hate WWF WWF style cage matches in the first place. And okay. that match, as great as it was, and I, I acknowledge it was great, it just didn't do anything for me. Oh. Do you prefer cage matches which end uh, with pinfall? NWA I style? I prefer cage matches in an actual cage, not some sort of blue contraption with... I love that blue oh, thing. Okay. Gotcha. <laughs> you know? That like, blue I, thing was a masterpiece. I grew up with world class. That's kind of that kind uh, of that kinda, expectations yeah. for cage matches. Texas. Gotta that be bloody. Sense. Gotta be, you know, bar not, not barbed wire, but cross-fencing. But hey, it's just a personal opinion, that's, yeah. Uh, that's Magnum and Tully right there. All right. The event started with our announced team, Gorilla Monsoon and superstar Billy Graham. Now, Billy Graham, I got to give him a dues because when you think of Billy Graham, you don't really think of a, a guy who's a good a commentator. But Billy Graham actually delivers, in my opinion. Yeah, he, he wasn't, wasn't bad. Him. I'll tell you this. He just wasn't bad. I yeah, really because it wasn't all, all catchphrases. Like, he did analyze each and every one of the matches. So, mm -hmm. I, I figured myself, as a color commentator, he did a job. No, he delivered. Yeah. I was kind of bummed because I was hoping he might be able to go back in the ring at some point. I, I used to be a huge fan of his. But uh, I really thought he was good on this show. Like, yeah. I enjoyed the commentary he did with, with a couple of people. He did primetime with Bobby. A couple of matches for primetime with Bobby Heenan as well. And I Like, only him and Bobby? Him and Bobby doing commentary at Boston Garden, I think it was, on primetime. Like kind of weird putting those... like, two guys like that together as a commentating <laughs> team. Well, they, they always kind of changed them up from house show to house show. They had Lord Alfred Hayes and Gorilla Monsoon sometimes. That, Hayes oh, that kind of not, as a ho not as a host for, for primetime. Yeah. I'm just saying for the matches and yeah. themselves. I think it was Boston Garden or something. All right. Because they so, always rotated gonna... commentators there. Hmm. Good to know. But I never thought the combination of Heenan and Graham only would actually work. But he was saying it worked. I'll be I'll, I'll be honest though. I haven't seen them to get listen to them together in 35 years. Maybe my memory is kind of <laughs> nostalgia colored, hazy. Yeah. Yeah. Hazy is always good for me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The first match on in SummerSlam history was a tag team match between the British Bulldogs and the Rougeau brothers. Now this is the SummerSlam where. Uh, one of the Rougeaus punched uh, Dynamite Kid in the face after the match or before the match or whatever. Did it happen like during that time or did it happen like later later on? I thought that happened before that. Did it happen I'm before sure. that? Do you remember, anyone remember the time frame? I don't remember the exact time frame, but I, I, I do remember reading that they booked a, a draw in this match in order not to have to deal with anybody having to do the job in this one. So it must yeah. have happened, or at least they had problems before that. Maybe the punching happened after. I, I think the punching maybe have happened after because if it did happen before, these two teams, even though they hated each other, worked amazing in the ring. 
These guys were amazing. Great coordination. Great uh, teamwork by all opponents throughout the match. These guys were professional all the way. That's why I'm surprised that the, the, the accident happened could have happened like earlier than that. Because okay. if it did and they, and they kept the match like the same as it was, it's amazing. You make a really good point there. So I believe it, does... it, it happened. Um, I, I'm not sure about, about this uh, time frame, but I'm sure it, uh, it happened uh, probably before the Survivor Series because they were on opposing teams and I believe they didn't touch each other during the bouts. And the yeah. original elimination was very, very at a, at a very early stage. So, yeah, but I can't remember the rest. However, still, I've got a problem with this uh, outcome. Because I, I, I've got an eternal problem with time limit draws as a finisher. I think it kills the crowd, kills the audience, and at a tag team match, even more. So, during this week, I've had some, some sort of a flashback remembering another tag title match. Well, a tag team um, match, okay. Uh, yeah, but this one was a tag title bout, which ended in a draw. So that was very, very, very strange because I managed to think about it, recall the match, forget about it, and then recall it again, which uh, is apparently only one of the things I'm able to do. So I took no chances and wrote it. It was um, not a WWF match, but it was um, in WCW. Miracle Violence Connection and the Steiners had a 30-minute time limit draw. And um, Steve Williams and Steve Austin versus Rhodes and Wyndham was also a tag team time limit draw. And I just don't get it. I understand the reasoning Oliver gave, but why would you give even the option of a time limit draw in tag team matches unless the time factor is important. I don't know, in a tournament, gets a bye. Crockett Cup, I believe, have had one or two. Or in an Iron Man match where the time is m more of a major factor. Just out of the blue, can't understand it. There you go. Finish I'll try game. to answer that with an equivalent to the cinema. Um, Rocky won. Okay. You saw the movie? Of course. Okay, they won 15 rounds and then it was a tie. Like he, like a draw, he retained the championship. So you build it up from there. And that way it tells the two stories. Number one, he couldn't beat the champion, but if he had a couple of more minutes, he could. And the champion couldn't beat the challenger and he wants to beat the challenger. So I'm going to dwell you... into Rocky one for a moment there. Wasn't it the uh, referee's dis judge's decision at the end? Yeah, of course. Did... But in the, it's still it's still like you could say it's, it's not the referee's much of a decision. draw. But it also can end in a draw, like in a similar way. But the, but the bottom line is, if you do a draw between any opponents, let's say, let's say for instance, this example, it's to just build it up to a rematch later on because neither team got the win, neither team defeated the other one. So we, we want to prove we can beat the other one. That's how you build it from a draw to a decisive match, in my it opinion. It wasn't made into a program, though. Because of, you know, <laughs> various... Yeah, problems. I know why. Like punching someone you know, in the face with a roll of quarters, so, you know. Was minor, it just minor me or, I, I just want to ask, was it just me or was something wrong with Dynamite's pants? I didn't notice. Wasn't it outside, uh, inside out or something? But, like, I, would, I wouldn't be surprised because it is Dynamite and he does strange stuff. <laughs> I didn't notice. I thought the okay. flag was okay. okay. That's, it. That's basically all I had to say about this one. All right, Oliver, your thoughts on the match. Uh, first of all, you were completely right. It happened right after that match. Oh, but there you it, go. it was the first, the first shot, so to speak. Dynamite socked Jacques Rougeau after Kurt Henning had cut up Dynamite's clothes while those two teams were in the mm -hmm. ring. Mm -hmm. Then it kind of built from there. So Raymond was on crutches, wasn't he? That Raymond? was possible. Raymond was on crutches, and that's why he couldn't uh, retaliate for Jacques. And mm -hmm. um, and he, he told uh, he told Dynamite, you know, you're gonna hit a. A man on crutches, and he said, "No, I'm gonna wait till you heal." Well, they did. Three weeks later, bang. Yeah, yeah, yep. that's, a, that's a punch out right out of nowhere. No. They had to pay for this one, right? They had to pay for SummerSlam. No, no, they had to pay for the um, um, the Rujos had to pay Dynamite for the dental thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, they they kind of knocked out three or four teeth of his with with the knuckle roll. Yeah, yeah. That mm -hmm. roll was hard. I think Jacques had a roll of coins in yeah, yeah, yeah. Jacques. Exactly. 
That's right. right. You can see that on the uh, Dark Side of the Ring episode when you talk about the Dynamite Kid. Okay. Hmm. Okay. So to answer your question, I really like this match. I really enjoyed the match. Um, I was puzzled to open a pay-per-view with a draw. Mm -hmm. Same. It kind of set, set an interesting pace. But sometimes you got to defy expectations. If people think it's going to go 10 minutes, sometimes you got to go 20. If people think it's going to be over in 20, maybe you got to go 60 at some point. The same. I thought the outcome was very surprising. I thought that the crowd was going to turn on it, and it didn't. They actually accepted it in the end. And the crowd was over for the Bulldogs. The Bulldogs, if I had to choose the three most biggest pops of the night, the Bulldogs were probably in the top three. Really, the crowd was way behind them. So yeah. that's basically their um, that's their last WWF tag match. As yeah, then like, they had Survivor Series, and then they were out of there. Yeah, and then uh, it was I believe there was an incident where um, uh, Davy was about to make a show, and Dynamite called the company and said he he died or something of a sort. <laughs> yeah, I remember yeah. something like that. That's dark. Yeah, that, that that's Dynamite for you. Yeah. <laughs> Wow. Okay, so that was the opening match. Afterwards, we get a segment of seeing uh, Brutus about a beefcake in a match on Superstars or Wrestling Challenge or something when he gets attacked by the outlaw Ron Bass. And then, <laughs> funniest thing ever, he attacks him, he opens him up, and then we see an X, a censored sign, and the X barely covers up anything. <laughs> you can actually see what exactly what happens. And the storyline right. is he attacked Brutus Beefcake, who was supposed to meet the Honky Tonk Man for the Intercontinental Championship, so he's injured. So they're going to find somebody else. So later on, we get an interview with Hockey Tonk Man saying, I don't care who it is. So Mean Gene wants to tell him, you know, I can tell you who it is. No, no, don't tell me who it is. I want to be surprised. So when I get to my match later on, because I can beat anybody in the World Wrestling Federation because I'm the greatest intercontinental champion of all time. Well, you know, Very seeing smart. Their, seeing their uh, encounter at uh, WrestleMania 4, Beefcake and Hockey Tonk Man, I just got to say to the late Ron Bass, thank you for just not making us watch this again. Okay, but the, quick, the big question is, why did they remove Brutus the Barber Beefcake from this matchup? Because of the storyline assault of Ron Bass, was, that, was it all planned? Or was there a specific reason why they didn't want Brutus Beefcake to get the match? I asked Beefcake this many, many years ago. Oh. He said it was just always laid out this way. Hmm. So, okay. He was supposed to get the Intercontinental title at some point. There was a problem between him and Honky. And then they came up with this scenario. I remember being really pissed off when I was watching this for the first time as a kid. Because I was really looking forward to that rematch. So <laughs> you, you can call me the Antichrist now because I really didn't know anything back then. I just know that I enjoyed Brutus Beefcake. I kind of liked his gimmick with the sleeper hold and, the, and cutting people's hair. <laughs> but yeah, I was really disappointed at Ron Bass. But um, in hindsight, I got to say, it created one of the greatest moments I've ever seen in the WWE pay-per-view. Yeah, I'm I, get I, I, I really didn't, didn't expect to be Ultimate Warrior. Because he wasn't that big a star at the time. He didn't didn't really make all that many television appearances. And then he did. Oh. Cool, but you know, it's it's one of the rare cases where the substitute delivers. And many, and, and many times, yeah, Savio Vega, I'm looking at you. <laughs> substituting for Michael. So, uh, yeah, 95 obvious. King of the Ring, yeah. All right, so afterwards, the next matchup is between Bad News Brown and Ken Patera. I wrote to myself in my notes, Ken Patera looks like Richard Simmons. <laughs> and there's the guy looked like Richard Simmons, same ensemble, same hairstyle. And mm -hmm. I'm like, was Ken Patera ever a thing? Not, I don't want to like insult the person because I don't know him, but still, I don't see anything exciting or anything, anything in Ken Patera as a wrestling figure. Was there anything special about Ken Patera? Do we have to tell the, uh, the the jail story, or are you aware of it? Besides the jail story, is there anything no, special no. about Ken Patera? It's, it's important because it has um, it has Go special ahead. meaning. Go ahead. Basically, Ken Patera served as a um, uh, as a Bobby Heenan. I don't want to say henchman, but one of the more major Heenan family members. He works on Andre, uh, and um, you know, tags with uh, with Stud and Heenan, all of that. Then came the jailhouse issue, as he tossed a was it a stone or a boulder or what? I into the, uh, yeah, him and Masasaito. It was a major, major rock. It wasn't Don Morocco nor Rocky Maivia. It was a standard rock. Tossed it into the window of a McDonald's, and apparently McDonald's uh, didn't 
treat this uh, very, very well. They didn't say, we're sorry for closing early. They said, we're sorry for having <laughs> our window in the road, in, in the way of your brick. So <laughs> he goes to jail and he comes back and they try to play on the, um, um, on the more um, humane side of it and saying he got, came back from jail, he deserves a second chance. And Heenan says, I don't want such a, a jailbird in my, uh, in my family. Then he turns face and it flopped as a result. I swear the only thing I remember from face Ken Patera was his tag team feud with Billy Jack Haynes versus Demolition because Billy Jack Haynes was a cousin of Brady Boone whom they mistreated. It's all downhill for face Ken Patera since there. He was just a uh, Ken Fong. That's all it. over your thoughts. Well, unfortunately, it didn't just look like Richard Simmons. He also wrestled like Richard Simmons at that point. <laughs> I, I really used to enjoy him in the late 70s and early 80s when he was still Ken Patera, the beast. But I didn't think he made a good a good baby face. And I really didn't think he was all that effective in WWE, in, in the WWF at the time. He was a product of pre-Hulkamania WWF. Mm -hmm. Then they tried to make him a Hulkamania WWF character and really never got over. And I also didn't understand him. I mean, I understand that he went to the Olympics, right? As but, a fan? <laughs> you bought a ticket? <laughs> <What? laughs> no, I understand he went. But um, I didn't understand why they gave him the Olympic theme as his, as his walkout theme. Weird. It, <clears throat> yeah, it kind of felt like a, a worse version of the Hercules theme they came up with later. Uh, I wrote myself about the match. Eh. A man match. The finish came when he was supposed to uh, like run him over, and then Bad News then was supposed to move, but he botched it the first time. He got him on the second time, and then he got the ghetto blaster. How mm -hmm. come Kempatera, Hercules, and Billy Jack Haynes all have the same finisher at Full Nelson? Because it was a popular move at the time. But isn't there like an unwritten Warlord, rule? Nothing about Warlord here. It, no, <laughs> was it, it wasn't a finisher back then. It was still part of the tag team. No, no, I'm talking well, later on. No, I'm talking about this <laughs> specific point okay, in time. Okay, this time for him. Go in ahead. In a specific point in time, you got three guys who have the same finisher. At least mm -hmm. two of them has a story why they have both, both finishers the same, and they had a fight in WrestleMania 3, if I'm not mistaken. But mm -hmm. a third? <laughs> Isn't it an unwritten rule in wrestling that you, don't, you can't have the same finisher as the other guy unless there's a good uh, reason for it? Maybe uh, that's uh, how they came up with the idea, not, have, not to have people have the same finishers. I don't know. Maybe. I don't think I don't think face Ken Patera ever applied the full Nelson for a victory. Perhaps in like in, in, in squashes, perhaps, <laughs> but he was much more of a major force as a heel than as a face. As okay. a face, you know, he he he'd, he'd be uh, you know he'd just lose to upcoming stars, and that's it. So here's a question for you: Is a full Nelson a good move? For a baby face. No. Hmm. No, because it has, a, kinda... it, it has a sadistic nature which shouldn't go to a baby face. It's it's more of a heel move. Right. And then you've got the three quarter Nelson for Barry Horowitz, which is like a quarter <laughs> isn't as good. It's because he you gotta take a quarter star off for his matches, right? Uh, that's right. And he only pins with those. I think, and I have to go a little bit later on in wrestling when mm -hmm. I talk about the full Nelson, I think one of the good choices of a finisher for full Nelson has to be Chris Masters when he did the whole master lock thing. That is, that is, a, that is a good uh, version of the full Nelson and a way to tell how this move is devastating as a finisher because it works better on, on a, as a, for a heel instead of a face. I don't really see a face using that finisher as a finishing role. That's right. It's just a, a visual thing to me because... It, it, it comes off as really effective when you flail around the opponent. That's right. You kind of feel bad for the opponent. If you're a baby face doing the move, you don't want people to feel bad for the heel, really. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. and uh, I'm, I'm going to say something which may sound odd, but it has some sort of, um, once you start waving the opponent over, it has some sort of a bragging nature which fits for a heel. Which, like, you know, I got him and ain't going to release him and feel the best. <laughs> I, so, got okay. I got him. I oh, got him. I got him. But yeah, right. I, I would have been very happy if this match had been two minutes, not six minutes. I would be happy if this match was canceled, but you know, <laughs> you, gotta, you gotta you gotta pay them. <laughs> you gotta pay the guys. 
Although, once again, full credit to Bad News Brown. What a guy. Gordon nailed it on the button when he said he was the first variation of a Stone Cold, a badass, some guy who could have been champion but never got the credit to. Mm -hmm. Full praise to Bad News Brown. He was also given a really a raw deal here because he was supposed to wrestle Bret Hart at SummerSlam. Yeah, because of the whole uh, battle roll thing in the SummerSlam exactly. in the WrestleMania. The WrestleMania, four. yeah. But um, and here's something I really never understood about WWF: they kept splitting up the Hart Foundation and then putting yeah. them back together and splitting them yeah. up again and trying to fire Jim Neidhart, but then not unfiring him to have them keep the titles. It was like weird. So they tried to split the Hart Foundation in '88 with Hart and Brown. In 89, you know, the, um, shall we say the, uh, what's a good example? The Survivor Series. He goes into uh, Duggan's team and he looks so out of place with the board and uh, the thing they do prior to the match. And yeah, only in 90, it, um, it, um, it began and, and it became a real strong showing for him at the uh, Survivor Series 1990 final with the, um, the, 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 the Biasi and Brett. Yeah. That was perhaps their best wrestling display of uh, this evening. And then he goes to SummerSlam 1991 and wins the title. Just gotta yeah, reiterate, I just gotta reiterate what Oliver said. Here's the thing I don't understand about the World Wrestling Federation. That's the thing you don't understand. Like the, the entire <laughs> thing you don't understand. He understands everything <laughs> else. Let him. Like everything else, is, uh, the hunky dory. All right. <laughs> Next up, we got a. Uh, Next up, we got an interview with the Mega Powers, and they're talking about their secret weapon. We're going to talk about that later on. But and, and when we talk about the main event, we're going to talk about the entire unfoldment of the main storyline of what exactly came to be mm -hmm. at the main event. Next matchup is Ravishing Recruit versus the Junkyard Dog. And I said it before, I hate the network for changing Recruit's music. Get the, get the rights for it. I mean, come on, it sounds horrible. I just hate it. I really, really hate it. But how, but somehow they actually kept the original theme for Junkyard Dark, which is but, weird. Yeah. How, how do you decide that? How come? What you had to pay him the difference than the other guy? What? What are you? What are you doing? One is they Jim probably Johnson. Probably toss a coin. One is Jim Johnson. The other is Jimmy Hart. But I have no idea what the what the what the concrete deals were with those guys. That is just weird. Now the match was okay. The ending was botched, in my opinion. But first, let me hear your opinions about the match, and then I'm going to tell you why I think the, match, the ending was botched. So, Gordon, you're up. What were your thoughts about the match? I believe this, the sole purpose of this match existence is mainly to uh, advance the uh, Rude Roberts feud. I don't see them, like, um, them, that is, being uh, Rude and the JYD, I don't see them operate very well in the ring or have any good chemistry. And... JYD is on a decline here. It's actually his last pay-per-view on Vince's as well. And yeah, he was he was popular. You can't deny it. But I think it mostly came during the um, JYD race feud. Other than that, no, he was like you know third tier babyface, perhaps fourth tier, but nothing aside from this one. Oliver, well. I didn't understand why they didn't get Rick Rude and Jake Roberts after that. Such a fire angle on yeah. superstars. Uh, I have no idea. To, maybe they tried to prolong, prolong keeping those guys apart in an actual match, but Rude against Junkyard Dog served no purpose, really. It's kind of weird because WrestleMania 4 had them both on the first round for some reason. Such a hot feud. Won't you build towards it? I don't know. In, uh, in separate brackets, do something. It's, it's like all, all they've done was um, do the uh, Rude Elimination at the Survivor Series by Jake. And, like, that's it. I mean, Junkyard Dog at the, at the time was already on thin ice. And I think they announced him for the Survivor Series afterwards and then took him yeah. out of the team. He was, uh, I believe, was he the one replaced by um, Scott Casey? How can we yeah, get, get so. back to Scott Casey? I don't think his family talks of him this often. I love Scott Casey. He's one of my favorite wrestlers from that period. Yeah, but his WWE yeah. tenure yeah, was not great. But there were so many others. I mean, Ron Bass was so much better in the NWA as well. A yeah, lot of those guys were better somewhere else. <laughs> Let's be but, honest. So. Was Bass a part? Was Bass a part of the Kansas Jayhawks, or am I missing? Or is that Dutch Mantel? Oh Jesus! Is that a football team? 
<laughs> what is it? He uh, had a tag team. I believe it was he was either him or or uh, Ron Bass. It either Ron Bass or Dust Mantel were tag team with the Black Bart's. Um, Black Bart and Ron Bass and Black Bart had a feud. They were tag team partners before that, and then they feuded with Ron Bass. I think being babyface. Right. Okay. Black Bart okay. being with Paul Jones. I think Ron Bass's former manager. Black Bart had a tenure with Paul Jones. I like the ne next next thing I remember Black Bart doing is being the, um, the trio searching for uh, Stan Hansen, the Sprados. Yeah. yeah. So we're there. So their team was named the Long Riders. Wasn't the Long Riders the uh, Irwin Brothers? Well, I'm just saying what, what the internet's saying. Aren't they we're the smoking going... guns in the IWF? The that's Long that's Riders. Right. Yeah. yeah. We're going into the obscure here. So it was J.J. Dillon, not Paul Jones. Oh. Okay. That, yeah. he, he, I remember him feuding with uh, Dillon. Aside from that, to close the entire Bass discussion, I seem to remember Nicole and Ron Bass dying not too far um, apart from each other. That's an interesting reference. That's morbid. That, that's that's morbid. Uh, morbid, uh, morbid uh, that's morbid what I do. Back. All they right. weren't related, though. No, no, not. So here's the thing. First off, as to your point, why wasn't this match Rick Rude versus Jake Roberts? Did they have a match in main event sometimes later on? Then there's no reason not to have the match tonight. And now, yeah. if you, now okay, you're doing the match tonight. The whole purpose of the match is to do the, the, the finishing, which was a disqualification victory for Rude because Jake Roberts intervened. But it mm -hmm. looked like the timing was way off. Like Rude starts to climb the turnbuckle. He then realizes, oh yeah, I forgot to take the trunks off. He takes the trunks off while he's standing on top of the turnbuckle, lands with a fist, and did he botch it? Because he didn't land the fist, and then Roberts enters the ring and attacks Rick Rude. It all seems like a whole mess. Like somebody's cue wasn't on time. They botched it entirely. So yeah, in the ending, and Rick Rude wins by disqualification because Jake Roberts attacks him. What exactly do you want to accomplish in this? That's a good point. I know that they had a, a house show feud afterwards. I think Roberts and Jake headlined. Yes, they had a um, they had a finisher match, a series of finisher matches in which I believe whoever hits the opponent first with a finisher wins. I always yeah. thought it was it was kind of weird to put that kind of stipulation in a video game. You don't tell me that actually happened in real life. Yeah, it happened. I'm sorry to tell you. Sorry to be wow. the one to bring it up, but it happened. That, that's weird. That's just weird. Uh, you know, uh, when, uh, Owen, when you said uh, switching stuff around, I think that if we'd have Rude and Roberts, then that means we're going to have uh, JYD and Hercules. And I don't think the crowd wants to see that. That's okay. They didn't want to see Jake and Hercules later on, but we'll talk <laughs> about that. Okay. But it, just, it just makes sense to put Roberts and Rude in a match here that ends, I don't know, with a DQ victory for Rude, whatever. Then that leads to Survivor Series where Rude leads his team against Jake's and then Andre eliminates Jay. That kind of makes sense. Like It doesn't make any sense to have this match here because it doesn't amount to anything. That's true. It doesn't. You're, it, you're using this pay-per-view in order to build forward for some reason. I don't know why. Yeah. Is that, maybe why you, is that maybe why you don't like SummerSlam? Because it kind of feels like they're building other stuff yeah, that yeah, it's, that's it's, supposed it's, to be a blow-off? It's like a pay-per-view being here for the sake of completing the big four. Here, we've got it another is. one. <laughs> Back Wonderful. then, it was. It was a paper to get to complete the, the big four. But I ha there were times in history that SummerSlam did have these big matches that culminated in ending feuds and stuff like that. It did happen a couple of times. I agree. I can't remember exactly when, but, you know, I'm just saying. But it, it did it happen. <laughs> well, it's been around for like 33, 34 years now. So. 34, yeah, something like that. 34, what year? 2021. Too long, man. Too long. There have been 34 SummerSlams, so to speak. Yeah. Are, you, are you saying it's too late to complain? <laughs> I think we're way yeah. past that with WWE. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay, we get the interview with the Honky Tonk Man and about him being a humanitarian, about he doesn't care who his challenger is. Then we get to the next match, which is also weird because we got on one side the Bolsheviks with their manager slick. How does that even work? <laughs> the other side, you got... The powers of pain and their manager, Baron Von Rushke. Mm -hmm. Right, Von Rushke? Yeah, that's mm -hmm. right. All right. Couple of questions here. I'm just I just gotta ask. Number one, 
Bolsheviks and slick. How does that even work? It's it's sort of an inheritance because the slick worth worked with the uh, the foreign connection she can Volkov. Okay. And oh yeah. That's then, right. And then she, you know, uh, drove with Chic Duggan. And, where he went out, by the yeah. way, that's right. That's right. And they just decided to duplicate Volkov. So here's we're basically staying with the same foreign team, even though they're both this time around from the same foreign nation and not Iran. All right. So, yeah, okay, so we got Slick here. Now, on the other end, you've got the Powers of Pain, which I like, but that's very, very strange to watch them as faces and have the Baron around for, like, a second and a half. And this match is, like, one of the, like, 50,000 matches these two tandems had, and I believe Powers of Pain didn't lose... Any 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 match in this confrontation? I just gotta say this before I give you the microphone, guys. I talked about demolition in our earlier podcast <laughs> about them being a copy of Legion of Doom, the Road Warriors. This match is basically the bootleg of the Road Warriors versus the Coloss. You will not change my mind about this. This is this is it. This is bootleg versions of the Coloss versus the Road Warriors. They even have the ha- same hairstyles and the powers of Fain's uh, side. Okay. This is it. Now, but having said that, I don't think this was a bad match. I was actually surprised that the Bolsheviks actually got a co- couple of offenses in because they usually get smothered and get annihilated. But this was a decent match. But still, this is a bootleg version of Koloffs versus the Road Warriors. That's it. Well, you may be surprised to learn that. And I'm right. <laughs> you may. Uh, I think it's one of the um, best of the WWF tapes, one of the volumes. I think it's the one where all the heels win. And one of the matches was the Bolsheviks getting a victory, pinfall victory, that is, over the Bulldogs. There is such a thing. There is such a beast. Yeah. That's amazing. Uh, Yeah, it's it's kind of unusual. But kind of? There you go. Yeah, yeah, kind of. So to talk about your analogy, I think you're not far off there because Nikita Koloff was a southerner with a really thick accent. Boris Zukov was a southerner with a really thick accent. Mm-hmm. It kind of works. Yeah. Nikita might have been a better better worker, though. Yeah, but both Nikita and Ivan were better workers than uh, Kol- uh, Volkov and uh, Zukov. So no offense to Volkov and Zukov, but still. I got to say, though, I, have ne- I think I've never seen a more Russian-looking American than Boris Zukov. <laughs> I agree, uh, yeah. by the way. I, I thought this was a really strong match. It was a good yeah. showcase match for the Powers of Pain. Um, like you guys, I don't really get how Baron Von Roschke was with them. Like, when I, whenever I saw him, I thought of the Emperor from Star Wars. Not exactly. <laughs> exactly. Not Emperor exactly of Palpatine, yeah. But um, I, I enjoyed the Powers of Pain at the time, but I, did, I also really never felt that either Demolition or the Powers of Pain, even though they were clearly blatant road war ripoffs, the Powers of Pain, I never felt that they were out of place in the WWF. I really was a big fan of, of the Barbarian because he looked like he could take your head off. I kind of liked the Warlord for whatever reason. I can't even tell you why, but that that team always worked for me. And I was so bummed out when, when they got turned heel. But I guess, come he, on. I guess he didn't like, didn't you like WCW Super Assassins? Yeah, kind of. Hmm, so there you I, go. I don't... I Baron, like by it. the way, I, I want to say something about Baron. Sure. Someone has to. Sure. Uh, Baron, I believe, had a face run in the NWA, I believe, against Paul Jones at, like, blink and you'll miss it uh, sort of event. All right. And then he came back at Slamboree as a heel again. Oh, come on. Can't you, can't you see? We remember your, uh, <laughs> well, barely remember your then face run. Yeah, so I, I also having I'm also having trouble understanding why would uh, why would they think that he need they need a manager? Okay, I understand why, but why this manager? He doesn't really talk. He's got his like cloak, but that's it. It's not a talking manager. I know you guys are fans of the powers of pain, and I think they're a good tag team, but not as faces. I don't buy them as faces, even though they have the whole persona. Kind of like the Road Warriors. Even the name, Powers of Pain, 
That's a heel name. That's not a face. That's not a name of a face tag team. If you take a look at them, they don't even act as faces. Like uh, uh, on well, the same side, uh, they could have been to heels. Their, to their this, to their uh, defense, not neither did the Roll Warriors. They were just demolishing people. So you know, but people love the Roll Warriors. They were faces, but you know, they uh, yeah, exactly, but they weren't every, exactly faces. Since you've mentioned it, every heel turn of the Road Warriors in the end of the year failed because of the fact the crowd cheered them up. They didn't want to see them as faces. Yeah. They turned on Dusty. They get cheered. Their, um, their first run, and when they get the tag straps, they're cheered for, for defeating the freshly faced turn Midnight Express. How can you be a heel with such an audience? Exactly. It's kind of their wrestling style. Mm -hmm. Like when you keep destroying everybody they put in your path, obviously people are going to like you. I mean, that's right. You got the charisma. You got, that's sure. Yeah, just, yeah. Look, just look at Goldberg. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Goldberg, Brock. I mean, Brock was, was one of the worst heels in WWE. Like worst in, in terms of doing evil things, but people just loved him destroying people. Yeah. I just uh, remember that was uh, watching uh, Starcase in 97 again, and I saw Goldberg. He was a heel against Mongo McMichael, but he demolished him, and the people loved it. So it worked. Everybody loves a winner. Yeah. Unless yeah. it's Roman Reigns, and it takes maybe a million years. <laughs> or John Cena, you know, for 20 years or whatever. All right. Uh, next up, we got a Brother Love segment. Brother Love with uh, Hacksaw Jim Duggan. Brother Love. Let's talk about Brother Love. A we have to. <laughs> A TV evangelist in the World Wrestling Federation. Was this a joke on someone? What was the point of Brother Love? How did this came about? Look, I should mention, know? I shouldn't, I, I don't know anything about his creation, but I should mention his segment is where the, um, the real important storylines flourished. Yeah. But I don't know if it's him, if it's the red lighting, it happened so slowly. And I, I, I because he talked like this and I, I love that's right. That's right. That's right. I, I, that. I couldn't couldn't stand the segments. I don't know. Give me the uh, the uh, the flower shop over it. If you didn't stand his segments that he did his job perfectly because you were but supposed that's a to hate him. That to me that's a go away heat. To our more modern viewers, a Vicky Guerrero heat. Okay. Excuse me. No. Oliver, your thoughts on brother love? Well, first of all, he's a fellow El Paso boy, so I can't really hate on him. Mm -hmm. But, um... Hope you're watching, Bruce. Hope you're enjoying this. Yeah. What's up, Bruce? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how do you do, Bruce? Um, but, um, I hated the character when I was, when I was a teenager. When, when it first came on screen, I, I couldn't wait to see him get beat up. But, he kind of worked for me. Like, I did... I. I, I didn't feel, to me personally, he didn't have go-away heat. I just wanted to see him get beat up by somebody. That's exactly, because that's not go-away heat. Go-away heat is, just, is the fact that they don't even let him talk. They let him talk. They like to boo him because that's a character you like to hate, and you like to see him get his up-and-comings. Up okay, so that means that's a good heel character. It wasn't go-away heat because it, it people wanted to see him get beat up. So if it's go-away heat, they don't even want to see him on screen. That's Roman heat, Roman Reigns heat. Back in the day, well, that's what it was to me, you know. Uh -huh. I I can understand him being. Um, I, I'll say this to him: he was he was a terrific heel. Yeah. Just that I couldn't stand him, and not not in the uh, heel hate standard way. And he did his job perfectly as the into in developing storylines like this one, for example, when he interviewed Hacksaw Jim Duggan in his pre patriotic stage because he wasn't really the red, white, and blue. He was really like before that. He was still wearing black trunks instead of the... But he talked about patriotism and the fact that... Dino, yeah. Oh. <laughs> the on. fact that uh, Dino Bravo was a more... Uh, he loved his country more than he did. And he's, a, he's from uh, Quebec. And then he just friend to beat him up. And that's it. But it developed the storyline of, hey, Hacksaw versus Dino Bravo. That's your basic Hacksaw interview from back then. Or to this day. <laughs> That, that's, I believe that is a basic conversation with Hacksaw. Sir, would you like to dinner? Would you like to eat? Oh, okay, you're like a sandwich. <laughs> Have I told here the um, the uh, Hacksaw storyline he tells in his book? Yes, I got his book. He says, he tells about the... Um, that, 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 I'm, I'm sorry to cut you off. Let me just yeah, let me just guess. The book is all caps. 
<laughs> screaming every word, and then it, it ends in USA or no. Could have been a, a great a great gimmick, but it, it's not. He <laughs> talks about his 2005 six return, in which he was um, uh, teamed with uh, Super Crazy. 2006, I believe. Yeah, or 2007 even. Yeah, and he Weird. says uh, well, they they've had problem problems to communicate. Really, I, and, I, yeah, I guess. <laughs> Um, but uh, all of a sudden, he's on a plane, crazy sitting not too far away from him, and he hears crazy ordering food in fluent English. <laughs> Oliver knows this one. And, and, and he's kind of shocked. He comes to crazy and you told me, they told me you can't speak English and so and so. And crazy looks at him and says, okay. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, yeah. Crazy was awesome. Uh, I remember a story I saw in a PlayStation 2 game of the Legends of Wrestling when Hacksaw tells a story about him, Jake Roberts, and the Snake Damien when they drive in the car. You know about this? I don't know this one. They were driving, so, something like this, is they were driving in the car with Jake and Damien was in the back seat in his bag. Somehow mm -hmm. he got out of the bag and then when Hacksaw's in the wheel, he, tur he turns around, he sees the snake right next to him. Ah! He almost crashed his car. <laughs> that was basically the story, but it, it was one of the funniest stories I ever heard. And Axel was a tough guy. Axel was a tough guy, yeah. <laughs> oh, by, by the way, I'm really happy to hear that his cancer is, is Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I've heard. That's awesome, because he's had, really had a rough deal over the past 15 years. That mm -hmm. is great news to hear when Axel has fully recovered from prostate cancer, and we would just, we just wish him all the best. Indeed. Hope you're watching this. All right. Uh, what do you hope? He's watching it. How, why wouldn't he? <laughs> we deliver. Uh, all right. Next up. We, okay. Before we get to the next match that we're going to talk about, one thing I forgot to mention. Mm -hmm. When the opening package opens with, uh, you know, the whole great graphics and stuff, I hear the music. But the music doesn't connect to me because I recognize the music as the Royal Rumble music, but it started off as a SummerSlam music. And I'm like, it just doesn't fit. It doesn't have the same feel. And to my to my uh, con uh, confirmation, the music changed around 1990 or 91 when they changed it to the more uh, known music of SummerSlam, and that music turned into Royal Rumble music. So, so yeah, I got one more of those for you. Okay, Jake Roberts' music started out as a training montage Hulk Hogan theme. Really? For the main event? Is that the training montage for Hogan with Gene Okerlund? No, it's no. the training montage no. before the main event in, in, in 88, where Hogan mm -hmm. was in the gym and pumping iron. They had wow. Jake playing in the background and then later got repurposed for Jake Roberts. I can't see it as anything else aside from Jake Roberts. And, and Bam Bam Bigelow's theme used to be primetime wrestling. This I remember. Really? Mm -hmm. Man, I love these little kind of secrets that's coming out. That's, you know, that's right. Hulk and Bigelow. Okay, the next match, Intercontinental Championship, the Honky Tonk Man versus a mystery opponent. He walks into the ring, gets the whole shabazz, and then he grabs the microphone. Give me, the, give me the next opponent. I don't care who it is. I can beat anybody. Crowd is silent. Nobody knows who it is. The, uh, keep the commentating team is selling this. Who is it? Who is it? And da, 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 da. it's the Ultimate Warrior. He runs to the ring like a maniac. He attacks the Honky Tonk Man. 31 seconds, something like that. Finishes the Honky Tonk Man off. One, two, three, new Intercontinental Champion. What a match. What an impact. Honky Tonk Man was a champion for over, almost over 14 months, right? Something like that. A thousand days or whatever. And he loses the championship in 31 seconds. What an ending. What a long and excruciating match. And Warrior even managed to botch a move in that short match. <laughs> yeah, because that's, that's, that's Warrior for you. Yeah. Yeah. I, I what I really loved about this was that the fans at Madison Square, Square Garden were really into everything, mm -hmm. because the second pop of the night, second biggest pop, turned, when the Warrior came out, the crowd the crowd blew up blew up for this. It was a genuine surprise; like people weren't expecting the Warrior because right. it wasn't that big yet. So there were probably ten other people, maybe Jake the Snake Roberts or Roddy Piper or whatever, that people were expecting more. Yeah. Maybe Scott Casey, for that matter. Hmm. You see that what happened? That's what happens when you don't read spoilers on the internet and yeah, you actually exactly. genuinely surprise to see exactly what happens. What is the internet in 1988? 
<laughs> it's still oh, a uh, screen on television. Gordon, your thoughts about the uprising of the ultimate warrior, him winning the Intercontinental Championship in 31 seconds. What an impact. What a I don't mind it. It was good. It was, it got what it was supposed to deliver. And basically, I think they've had a rematch on the next Saturday Night's main event. And it was like six of the longest match, uh, of the longest uh, minutes you'll ever have. And you get why they did this uh, this uh, one-sided bout here. We learned later on, we get an interview with the Honky Tonk Man. I was robbed. I want my, my, my belt back. I was robbed. And then an interview with the good guy. I, I wrote a couple of stuff right here. Uh, Warrior mm -hmm. says, the spaceship talked to me and it came okay. down. Sorry, something like that. Spaceship came down and pulled me up and landed me in Madison Square Garden. And the warriors of years past told me to win the chess, something like that. And I'm like, no, 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 wow. it, it, it happens every day. Yeah, but no, I, I don't see what's so unusual about it. <laughs> that, that Honky, is... didn't, Honky didn't even get time to take his jumper off. Yeah. <laughs> like, how is that a fair match? It's not a fair match. It's not. But I, I thought it was a really good idea. I mean, they tried to get the belt off of Honky a couple of times and he didn't really play ball. First with Randy Savage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Honky didn't want to lose. Then they tried to do the beefcake angle like two months before that, and Honky didn't want to lose to Beefcake at our show or the Saturday Night's main event. So they probably were pretty happy to get the title off of Honky now. Well, after 14 months, I'm sure they, yeah. were, they were happy about but it. But he was the greatest intercontinental champion in the history of the WWF. Yep. Or so he thinks. Or so he thinks. <laughs> well, he believes, yeah. yeah but... I mean, he, he was a better champion than Ricky Steamboat. Yeah. He you know, got, you know, the, the, the shafts. Because of uh, just wanting to uh, leave for a vacation earlier than usual. And I believe have his wife annoy everyone. So away with Steamboat and into uh, Mr. Ferris. Which was basically also what happened with Jake and Cheryl. Like first they wanted to have Cheryl go on the road with him so that she keeps him mm -hmm. on the straight and narrow. And then they couldn't wait to get rid of Cheryl because she was driving everybody crazy. You know, I've actually heard, uh, I believe this week, that they closed the... Um, I can't remember the name of the the, uh, the uh, Funkin' Dojo of Do Dory Funk. Oh, the closet? Oh. Yeah, oh. imagine that. And it was because of his wife nagging at everyone. Yeah. She kept yeah. calling the office and giving suggestions on storylines, on character ideas, on on yeah. how Dory should be focused on more in, in mm. the on the television. Well, Dory didn't talk. So <laughs> I guess that's his wife doing the talking right there. He wasn't a really big talker in person either, so it's, it's That's what? probably for the best that he did, wasn't talking. All, all he did, all he did in the um, in the Funk Brothers interview is doing the um, this. That, that was his talking for him. Yeah. I mean, plus, if you have Terry Funk as your partner, let him do the talking. Yeah, that <laughs> indeed, I agree. Now, when you talk about the rising of uh, specific wrestlers in the world of wrestling, you talk about you know elevation from. Uh, starting, uh, you know, like the starting match, a mid-carder, then you go to the mid-carder title, and that it was a good uh, projection to the Ultimate Warriors way of him being elevated and being groomed to be one of the biggest stars. And him winning the Intercontinental Championship in this fashion really helped him propel himself into the bigger upper card of the, of the World Wrestling Federation. And that is something I really miss out nowadays because you don't see it that this, this, uh, very often. Like, you don't see a guy become an intercontinental champion, a United States champion, and then they build him up as a uh, secondary champion, loses the title championship, and then he's, okay, he's ready for the big one. I don't see it that very often these days. It's, do you probably, agree? it's probably because they don't do long-term storylines story anymore. Like yeah, that's in, the problem. In those days, they, they planned the WrestleMania main event for, for the year afterward before they did the WrestleMania main, main event for this year. Yeah. And it really doesn't happen this way anymore. I think maybe one of the biggest exceptions to that could have been Seth Rollins because Rollins won the Intercontinental Championship at WrestleMania 34. And then he really tried to elevate the championship because it was, he made a vein of pay-per-view with Ziggler. It was a big storyline throughout the year. And then when he lost it, boom, he wins the Royal Rumble, elevated to the world championship scene. That is a good way to build somebody up, even though he was champion before, but you know, if you go like back and forth, back and forth. But I miss those days when you, get, you see a guy, he says, okay, let's build him up in a secondary championship program. He wins that championship. He defends it. He establishes himself as a good champion, lose the championship, and then, okay, he's ready for the big one. 
It doesn't happen that, that often, though. I'm, I'm kind of missing. Yeah, you know, it's it's uh, it's what I call what I refer to as um, uh, "Let's get it right this time around" title reign. It's a former champion holding the title once again, but this time we'll do it right. So, you know. Yeah. Well, they don't really have that many options anymore, considering everybody else is getting older. You know, so I've heard that they're spinning its wheels. If only we could get somebody younger in this company. Yeah. <laughs> if only we didn't let go 80 guys in 2021 alone. But anyway, we're back in 80. <laughs> we're mm-hmm. back in it. All right. Uh, next up, we got uh, Bobby Heenan talking to Billy Graham and Gorilla Monsoon. He almost falls off a ledge. <laughs> they had to have <laughs> Graham and Heenan and uh, Gorilla Monsoon hold him up because he almost falls off the ledge while the crowd chants weasel, weasel. Uh, and then we have him as a commentator for the next match for some reason. Hmm. Why I don't know why, but he was there. I was happy he was there, but still it was kind of weird. Next match, The Rock, Don Morocco versus Dino Bravo. And with Frenchie Martin as the Bravo's manager. A complete waste of time. I just wrote it in my notes. And the finisher, a sidewalk slam. I didn't I'm know. Sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Side it's suplex. a side suplex. So, that wasn't a side suplex. That was a side. What? Really? Side suplex? Nash, so the boss Nash manager. version is the same as uh, Bravo's version. It's a side Isn't suplex. that a sidewalk slam? It should now, be a side. It should be a if side you're Tony Schiavone, like if you're Tony Schiavone, everything is a sidewalk slam. It However, should've... back in the day, um, it was uh, referred to as a sidewalk slam. But within time, what you've got, what you've got as a sidewalk slam was uh, the bossman slam. Either when Mr. Hughes used it, and yeah, it just, some of them came, yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I kind of see your points. Okay, so it was a side slam. What? <laughs> so the side suplex went back, came back to Gorilla Monsoon. Basically, he miscalled it a side suplex, and they stuck with it. Okay. It's oh. not a suplex because there is no jerking motion. Yeah. Mm. It is a slam. It should be called a side slam, but it is a side they slam. didn't use that name. But a side slam as a finisher? Was Dino it? Bravo. Yeah. Bravo used to do wow. that. Wow. Those were I mean, simpler times, you yeah. know. There oh, were yeah. guys who had a body slam as a finisher. There were guys who... Who had a body slam as a finisher? Well, John Studd sometimes did. Yeah, that's why they had the whole body slam challenge, right? bear hug? I thought he was he did. for some reason. He did, but he also won a couple matches with a, with a body slam. Body slam is too simple to be considered a finisher. I remember him beating out that. I don't know, time. winning a match with, with, a, with a head smash into the turnbuckle. It probably happened at some point. <laughs> I mean, okay. people were submitting it in the full Nelson. We were still five years yeah. away from, from, from Bob Backlund doing his crossface submission. I heard of a guy winning with a headlock takeover. MJF. <laughs> That's a you know, with, uh, uh, gonna, okay. um, there's the there's the Heenan commentary of um, him during an Undertaker match, and uh, Taker doing the old school. Yeah, Heenan watches it and says, "I walked all four corners once." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Bobby was so good. Yeah, now, he, you probably good. may agree with me on this on this because when you think about wrestling, when you talk about a person who is not a wrestling fan, and you tell him you should see wrestling. The image he has in his mind of how wrestling is, is a Dino Bravo versus Don Morocco match. From the body type, from the way they wrestle in the ring. When you, when, you, when you tell someone about what is wrestling and he tries to imagine a wrestling match, this is the match he imagines. Dino Bravo versus Don Morocco, two beefy guys, my sorry, two beefy guys going at it, Big East, biggest fantasy. And it's an okay match. It's not very technical because they're both big guys, but it's an okay match with a very weird finish. That's true. Did they build it as a WrestleMania 4 rematch? Was it? it, did it WrestleMania 4 it had rematch, Bravo yeah. versus Morocco. Wow. No, they, they, didn't, they didn't say a word. Nothing about it? Okay. No, not, not, no, not Bravo, to my recollection. Okay, Bravo wasn't the, um, you know, too good of a wrestler. And uh, Morocco wasn't in his in his uh, heydays anymore, so that, that's what you get basically. He, he also hated working with Dino Bravo, but you could tell because he didn't go up for half his stuff. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah. No chemistry. No. Plus, the other thing is, it was weird hearing hearing superstar Billy Graham on commentary when Don Morocco was in the ring, just yeah. because he used to manage him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then that kind of ended from one day to the next. Yeah, they uh, basically uh, he was replaced uh, on the uh, Survivor Series Hogan team. 
Um, Graham by Morocco, if I recall what I'm eighty-seven, and then 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 Morocco had him as his manager. Yeah, this I remember. And then but, basically, but, Billy Graham went away as his manager, but he kept Billy Graham's theme. That's right. The uh, uh, Christ Superstar, I believe. Jesus Christ Superstar, yeah. yeah right. Which was a weird choice for Don Morocco of all people. I don't know. I think it kind of suited him. Well, if you don't know the text and, and the the origin and the context, obviously, yeah, mm -hmm. I loved I loved a theme song for mm -hmm. him, but it was kind of weird, in a way. Jesus okay. Christ Superstar is a theme song that I, I'm I'm pretty sure the church is suing someone over this. Perhaps, <laughs> or oh, maybe Andrew Lloyd. Webber, no. Or maybe Andrew Lloyd Webber or I don't know, Monty Python. I'm not even sure if it was Andrew Lloyd Webber, Webber but um, right. no, he should have had the Miami Vice theme. <laughs> there you go. We got an interview with Jesse the Body Ventura about him taking a bribe from the Million Dollar Man. He said, I made the right call. When someone offers you money, you take it. It doesn't mean I took a bribe. <laughs> that no, exactly it was exactly it that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, we're going to talk about him a little bit later. Uh, the next match, Heart Foundation versus Demolition for the Tag Team Championships uh, in the Demolition side. They have Mr. Fuji's their manager and also the mouth of the South, Jimmy Hart. Now, the story of the match is the Hart Foundation did a face turn after the whole Bad News Brown debacle, pretty much. They cast aside their manager, Jimmy Hart, and as retaliation, he tries to aid Demolition in their title defense. One note I wrote to myself on this uh, match, as a, I also wrote on the first match, because it kind of works together. Joey Morello was the referee for both matches. There are two instances in both matches when there's a tag, but Joey misses it. And then when the face guy comes into the ring, he says, no, no, I didn't see the tag. On, in both matches. <laughs> so I'm like, Joey, you, you weren't a very good ref, now were you? <laughs> If you miss it on both matches, they did the same spot in two matches. It's kind of driving me insane. He probably uh, had the same vision as his dad. Yeah. Glass is this mean? thick. You know, yeah, yeah. It, it was always very, very amusing to watch uh, Marilla matches with um, Monsoon on commentary. This referee is so and so. Yeah. It's Unfortunately, like Joey Morella went uh, passed away due to a car accident in around 94, I believe. So yeah, it, with uh, Harvey Whippleman on board. Yeah. Whippleman tells about it in his book. So here's a funny story. I really enjoyed the Demolition Heart Foundation match back when it happened. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But until rewatching the show earlier today, I had completely forgotten that it even took place at the, on the show. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but Heart Foundation were kind of a default challengers in this time period. Yeah, pretty much. But they were like the top team who could work. So, yeah. They got they got the um, the uh, the brain buster. They got demolition, even though Bervis is non title belt, but still. But yeah, the uh, line was so, there. Yeah, so but I the crowd were behind them. The crowd wanted them to win when they did the whole final comeback. Mm -hmm. But in the end, Jimmy Hart helps demolition to win. They grab their megaphone, hit Bret Hart on the head with it, pin him. Demolition retains. Oh, you remember uh, uh, Hart Foundation versus LOD? That was way later. Vaguely. Yeah, it was. It was. I vaguely it remember it. it. It actually, I believe, had a had a smart finish where they did the, um, I believe, the inverted power slam thing the Hart Foundation did, and I think they uh, used it um, as a finisher because Animal Power slammed him. Something of a sort. Like in reverse, he holds him in reverse. Yeah, and yeah, power slam yeah. On the opponent. Yeah. So I love when when there's thinking involved. I love it. So just to add a little bit of context to, sure. to, to what happened with the Hart Foundation after WrestleMania 4, they first broke them up, mm -hmm. had Brett go face, and Jim Neidhart stayed a heel with Jimmy Hart. Yeah. Which it was did not play. work. Like, it confused people because they wouldn't cheer Brett and wouldn't boo, boo Neidhart either. People were just confused. Yeah, they, that's that, that's kind of um, of the um, of the weird thing with Neidhart. I believe early in his run, he had Fuji as a manager. And that, that that's like an, an unlikely tandem if you've ever seen one. And Please, later, in the beginning, Bret Hart was a cowboy. True. Yeah. yeah, but he wasn't he wasn't saddled, pardon the pun, with uh, with a strange manager. Well, so there. He was. But saddled. yeah, Bret Bret was given the. Um, I'm sorry, Oliver. We'll get back to you in a moment. Um, Bret was given the uh, round the loop uh, feud with Brown. 
um, at house shows, at, at every time Brown was, you know, like given the, uh, the upper hand and the victory. So nothing came out of this one aside from turning Brett's face. Just one question. Did, when they broke up Jim and Brett, did they have a storyline where they get back together and then they turn on Jimmy? Well, they were mm -hmm. just together, uh, Not to the best of my knowledge. Just together, back back together randomly, and then Brett sent Jimmy Hart away once when, when Jimmy wanted to come to ringside to help Brett. That's right. That's, that's kind of what set it off. And right. then they had the uh, the Rujo's feud. Yeah. With the, with the contracts. With the All-American boys. That's right. All-American boys. That's right. I like that thing, on. But yeah, the match was pretty... I, I thought the match was pretty good, Demolition Against the Art Foundation. I didn't mm -hmm. like the finish all that much, but it was logical. Like, I, I was hoping at the time that Heart, the Heart Foundation would win because I really liked them back in the day. And One of my them. favorite teams. Yeah, and it really broke my heart that they kept breaking them up or trying to break them up. And I don't know why, but they wanted to let Jim, Jim Neidhart go twice, like two years yeah, later. Yeah, something like that, yeah. The, on, the only reason why they reconsidered was because Axe had to retire because of his heart condition. So they decided... That only happened, like, uh, two, two years later? Yeah. After the Survivor Series? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I believe that the, the thing about Naira was they kept rehiring him because Stu kept calling. <laughs> yeah. yeah well, uh, and then they had him put him put him had him put him put on a, a, an owl mask years later. Yeah, who that that was one of the greatest gimmicks of all time. I'm like what the hell was that during <laughs> Vince Russo's tenure or was that afterwards? No, no, I, I believe it was it was circa 1996. Okay. No, even before that, I think it was around 95. No, it could be, it could be 96, 95, because I remember watching yeah. him on the weekend uh, show, Wrestling Challenge, Superstar, stuff, stuff like that. Who okay. thought this was a good it, idea? I, first of all, I believe Neidhart, I thought about it this week for some reason. Neidhart, I believe, was the only um, American to use the camel clutch as a finisher with, with having no relations to Iran or the Middle East or anything. At the and, time, because then you had Steiner, Scott Steiner doing the Steiner recliner. Yeah, but I'm talking about uh, the variation of the camel clutch. Early 90s. And early 90s, yeah. About. And um, I believe there was a there was a 1996 match with Godwins versus T.L. Hopper and who? What, what, what the hell? I got nothing. <laughs> How do you yeah. even get to that match? What like, channel were you watching? A, yeah, it's, had, it's it's like a it's like a battle bowl right there. We had a, a Jim Neidhart Ted DiBiase match on on Wrestling Challenge over here, and I, I think that so. was weird. But your example has that beat ten times over. That yeah, had to you know, go to the, the plumber worst and the math guy versus the farmers, the god with the god with the hog farmers. That had to be a horrible be match. I mean, well, as you'd expect. I'm sure sometimes we're going to get to the episodes where we talk about an hour about Jim Neidhart wearing. Pajamas with Owen Hart as the new foundation. Pretty sure we're going to get to That's that. The, the taxi cab tights. Taxi cab tights. <laughs> yeah. All right. Next up, we had the big boss man with Slick and his manager versus Coco Beware. Coco was over completely. When he did his comeback in this match, the crowd erupted like this was a world championship match. I was in, That was insane how over Coco Beware was. When he no, I, the, I love this one. I love this one. Oliver? Go over, go ahead. When he hit that flying dropkick off the top rope against exactly. Bossman. Exactly. And Bossman sold it like a million bucks. Mm -hmm. Bossman was awesome. Oops, I loved Ray Trailer. Really. Yeah. He, the guy was phenomenal. Yeah, and he was still heavier than you'd get used to see him later yeah. on. But still, he that was a sight to behold. I bought into the guy back in the day, like when I was younger. He really did seem like a, an awful human being, so he really was good at, at his character. And Coco was one of those guys. Frankly, I, you know, I I believe I prefer the uh, heel boss man of you know blue outfit and all. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Over the uh, over the face boss man. I don't like um, uh, black uniform boss man of the '98. No one likes black uniform bar the SWAT team member boss man. Nobody liked that. How come they couldn't give him a black? How come they just couldn't take the the the, the same outfit with a different different color scheme? Like do that with a black version, and it would be awesome. Not a SWAT team member. That was horrible. He had the same. Yeah, he had the same outfit. Uh, you In know, WCW uh, as the boss. Yeah, yeah I know. You could have had that one. Was it the boss? Yes, yes. Was it the boss? He had another version as Ray Trailer. 
vodka, way, which Oliver, I like. You... Sorry about that. You haven't lived, Oliver, until you heard Bossman's theme in All Japan Pro Wrestling. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that, is, that is just awesome. It's a, it's basically, if, uh, if a, a local Japanese guy sang the big Bossman theme song in, yeah, in karaoke. That, that is which just is awesome. exactly what they did. <laughs> they did, did the same thing with Hiroshi Hase's theme. Hase's really? theme used to be a popular song in the U.S. Oh. Like in the 80s. With oh, lyrics. Awesome. People singing. <laughs> Um, they, they did that for all the songs. They did it for for Immigrant Song, for um, Bruce Brody's theme. They did it for for Vader's theme and New Japan. Oh, amazing! They, they did. They never used the Rainbow version, the original one. They always had a Japanese singer basically do it, so they could sell it on their CDs. Wow! I wonder if they ever did Real American from Hogan. <laughs> uh, no. Hogan used used um, for, Foreigner song. Hmm. Which one all was right. it again? I had a tiger. I have the t- oh yeah, that kind of makes sense. Yeah, that kind of makes sense. Hmm. Mostly used I had the tiger in Japan back back in the eighties. He did use his WWF uh, theme song afterwards, but then he didn't go back to all Japan or New Japan for that matter. Back to Bossman and Coco Beware. I remember this article in a WWF magazine. I don't remember which one it was, but it had an article about three of the most memorable matches in SummerSlam history, and it said the big Bossman versus Coco Beware. But in the article, it mentioned that this was the first match of SummerSlam. So I'm thinking, okay, this is the first match. Then I see this pay-per-view. It's not, it's not the first match. It's not even the second. <laughs> it's like the fifth or the sixth. So why? What? <laughs> it's really Wait, was this the article um, The article with the, with the dropkick shot? Yeah, yeah. No, no. He held so him I, in a... I he probably had a, it right here somewhere. He was behind him and he was holding his arm. Something like that. Like maybe two, yeah. maybe two pictures of that. It's kind of a weird article when I just saw the match afterwards. But overall, cool match. Liked it. The finish was a little bit weird because Coco was about to jump at him on, from the turnbuckle. I think the spot was supposed to be where Bossman just froze him outside, but he kept hanging on like it hurt him. And then he follows up with a, with the Bossman slam. But it didn't really hurt. It didn't look like he hurt him. He just, here, just go ahead. <laughs> put, him, put him on the side of the ring, and that's it. But he looked... Oh, he hurt me. Very weak finish. Yeah, I agree. See, okay. Coco, Coco was kind of an interesting character back in the day because I remember when, when the Pile Driver album came out, he was super over because of the Pile Driver song, and that video was everywhere. It was on MTV. It was shown here. It was shown there. They had it on Superstars every other week. But it felt like they never really capitalized on Coco. Maybe no? he was too small for Vince. I don't know. But he was a fantastic worker. Yeah, he cool. was. He really, the fans really loved him. The thing was, Frankie the Bird got over with the kids. So I never really understood why he never got a bigger role in the WWF. But then again, it's probably because it was too small. Mm. Could be. But also, I'll, I, even though Paul Driver is the more memorable theme song of the Co- of Coco Beware, I'm a fan of the Birdman. I just love that theme song. Yeah. It yeah. Was pretty good. I just love the Paul Driver video so much. You know, being being on the construction site, superstar Billy Graham with the, mm-hmm. with the big machinery going. <laughs> uh, great music video. It was so '80s. One question comes to mind as uh, his team up with Owen. Who came up with that idea? Do you know? I do not know. But it's kind of curious because good. when when Jim the Anvil Neidhart left in '92, Owen was all by himself, and then someone told Coco, "Hey, how about we put you in pajamas?" And then you'll be Owen's partner and you'll be high energy. Like, I like the tag team. I just didn't really understand how come these two got together, even though they were a good tag team. Probably. I know what you mean. It's, it's... Oh, go, go ahead, Oliver. Probably a process of elimination. Who would do we have in the roster who's not in a big angle? Ah, Coco. Let's put them together. They might be good. No idea. Well, We'd have to ask the, the, well um... luckily it wasn't Tito Santana. Then would it be the Los Matadores? Yeah, God. Can you imagine? Can you imagine Tito in pajamas? That Can you imagine? Insane. Yeah, I actually could. Yeah, well, Tito could have pulled it off. Sorry. It's uh, it's it's basically you know the uh, the two, um, two quite, uh, perhaps even very good high flyers, but personality-wise, it's like it's like the Canadian and the uh, and the and and the other guy. Personality-wise, it's it's kind of odd to me. But I like the tag team, even though they kind of went uh, like nowhere. 
all I remember they've done was the uh, Beverly Brothers feud, and that's like it. I didn't even know they had a feud with the Beverly Brothers. <laughs> well, a few people did. <laughs> didn't I'm not sure the Beverly Brothers were aware of it. Didn't they have a match at Tuesday night in Texas or something? I don't, th- I don't think so. Perhaps one of the dark matches. Yeah, probably. The one, the, the one they've had with uh, Sir Charles. Mm-hmm. What's it? Oh, uh, Charles. Are we talking yeah, about yeah. Shango? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Jesus, that's... <laughs> I so. I, All right. I totally Next up. What? I totally forgot about that. It's okay. You don't have to remember no, anything. No, about no sane person should remember it. <laughs> Next up. Uh, Jake the Snake Roberts and Hercules. They got 10 minutes. Why did they get 10 minutes? I don't know. And the funny thing is, if, if you did the running before to elevate the rude Roberts feud, how come you didn't do the same spot here? You just had to let it run for 10 minutes? Particularly since since Rick Rude and, and Hercules were teammates. Yeah, this Sometimes. is the Heenan family. Hercules is still in the Heenan family before he sold them to slavery. But, I mean... <laughs> Come on. You had the spot before to elevate the Rude Roberts feud. Okay, you did it fine. Why not do it here also? It, it, it seemed like in a moment, like near the end of the match, the crowd is looking towards the end way, like something's happening and nothing happens. So why? Why drag this out for 10 minutes? Even the crowd was tired by this point, but they came back at the end when he did the DDT and then when they jumped around, they were happy the match ended. It was just weird. Just weird. That's true. I mean, if I remember correctly, it was the fourth longest match on the entire Yeah, yeah it was the fourth. The first one was the 20-minute draw. Then you had the uh, the tag team match, tag title match, I believe. Mm-hmm. The main event and this one. Yeah. So whoever came up with the know, idea of just... giving Jake and Hercules 10 minutes right before the main event should have been fired. Doing something else. Yeah. Fired or hospitalized? Both. Was probably, was probably both. <laughs> hospitalized and then fired. I love it. I yeah. did like the finish, though. I, I loved how Hercules tried to body slam Jake, and Jake kind of slid off the back and did his DDT. Perfect finish. I always love that spot when he does the someone tries to do a body slam and then he just twists it around DDT. Jake has to be the wrestler in, in WWF at the time who got the most out of doing the least. Yeah, I think Ted DiBiase said it the best in one of the DVDs of WWF. He, 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 he was very envious of Jake because he did absolutely nothing and gained the most of it, which is brilliant. This is the only, this is the best way to wrestle. Doing the bare minimum and get the exact maximum. Perfect. Even though Gordon disagrees because I know he doesn't like Jake. Like in the ring. It's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to pop up in any podcast, apparently. Well, everybody has that one person who they really don't like, that nothing, mm. nobody else understands. So I guess Jake is yours. I apparently. <laughs> like mine, mine was Brett for most of most most of the time. Brett? I really? You're not a Brett fan? I, I I love Brett as a person. I loved him in the Heart Foundation. I was never a huge fan of his as a singles wrestler. Maybe for me, it's also- Michaels. I'm not a fan of Shawn Michaels as a, oh. as a human being, as a wrestler. I don't know him, but I'm, you know, from the stories I've read and heard. So, well, I, I kind of chuckled when when Kane and Undertaker let him crash and burn in in, in Saudi Arabia on that. <laughs> they were like, "Nope, we're not catching you." <laughs> Probably a payback from 20 years ago. Probably a payback, Ooh. which was awesome. Yeah. yeah. And now we get to our main event. The Mega Powers versus the Mega Bucks. Ted DiBiase and Andre the Giant with Bobby Heenan and Virgil in their corner versus Macho Man Randy Savage, the World Wrestling Federation champion, and Hulk Hogan with Elizabeth in their corner. The story of the match is this. Apparently, and this is brand new to me, apparently after WrestleMania 4, Hogan vanished to film a movie or something. So Savage was left all by himself. He started feuding with Ted DiBiase, you know, the house shows, defending the championship and stuff. And then it became a two-on-one affair when Ted DiBiase and Andre started attacking Savage. So Savage challenged them to a tag team match at SummerSlam. They accepted. But before even they accepted, there was an announcement made that there will be a special uh, referee for this match chosen by President Jack Tunney. And the referee was Jesse the Body Ventura because he is the, mo- the only guy who could keep this match fair and square. Yeah, right. 
<laughs> because if you don't know by now, Jesse Ventura is an unbiased <laughs> commentator that doesn't favor the bad guys at all, but he is the only guy that can call this match right down the middle. So when Savage uh, heard that his challenge is accepted, he reveals that his partner is Hulk Hogan. He's back. What a shock. And uh. they form the Mega Powers. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Longest handshake in history. <laughs> and we get to this match. This is, I think this is the first time in recorded history, in my, in my opinion at least, that I actually saw Hogan let someone else have his theme when he in the ring. Savage has his theme. He gets the credit for the entrance. Hogan gives him all the credit in the world. It's his theme. He's the World Wrestling Federation champion. And we get to the match. I'm going to talk about the match, if you don't mind, first a little bit. Mm -hmm. Starts off weird. Ventura wants to emphasize he, he calls the shot, so he changes turnbuckles. You know, there's a tag rope, so he just moves it from one side to the other. Doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Doesn't make any sense at all. Fine, you're in the ref. Go ahead. A very back and forth match. Very not very very a very nice match, basically. The ending came when the good guys are on the floor. All the villains are in the ring. They're all staring at Elizabeth, who's standing on the apron. And Jesse tells her, "Get down. Get get, get, get down back to the ring." And then they reveal the secret weapon. She removes her, she removes her skirt to reveal red panties. That that's the secret weapon, and everybody's in shock, and the crowd goes ballistic. And we see Savage oh, and Hogan I, I, on the outside doing the stupid hat shake again. That's 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 just weird. First of all, I <laughs> don't know. Really. I, I I should ask perhaps um, from a from a former referee standpoint, is this legal? How is it not? How is she interfering in the I don't know. Yeah, she's I, not interfering. I, I, I'll admit not having to... Uh, I, I didn't browse the rule book lately. I swear I didn't. But it's sort of a distraction. It's not a foreign object. But it is a distraction while she's still in the apron and not in the ring. So... I don't know. Was there any physical contact? No, so nope. it's not. It's not a disqualification. So you know, I'll I'll, I'll bring up one day uh, uh, an example with just the exact opposite of what you said. It contradicts. One day I'll find such an example. Can I? Oh, by the way, anything? the ending came when the Mega Powers win. Now, yeah. the point that Gordon made, then going to pass the microphone to Oliver. The point you said about uh, you know Hogan grabbing Elizabeth. I didn't see this much in this match. I, I saw it in the Survivor Series angle. When there, he actually lifted her up. And Savage was like, what the hell is he doing? <laughs> like, <laughs> here was like, this was pretty much like, it was okay. Because Hogan gave all the credit to Savage. He, she was on Savage's shoulder. He gave him every, like, all the credit. He, he was like, you're the champion. You're the guy. Yeah, we get this. And then on Survivor Series, he screws him. So this was the this was the good beginning of the Mega Powers, and then it all went downhill to towards Survivor Series, Rumble, and then, and then WrestleMania. Oliver, your thoughts on the match, the whole angle, and the handshake from hell. Even when I was 13 years old, I had no clue how somebody taking off her skirt and revealing nothing more revealing than you would see at any, yeah. um, any swimming pool, how it would distract Jesse Ventura. Ted DiBiase and Andre the Giant who have probably all had more poontang in their lives than most of us ever are gonna. It didn't make sense to me. Like, what was the purpose of this? Because it's scandalous. This is the 80s. <laughs> well, yeah, I was living the, I was living in the 80s and I, I was like, what is this? Why are people distracted? Why is this so dumb? Like, I didn't get it. Maybe you guys have... No, I, I got nothing. I mean, I saw well, it... I tried to find some reasoning to it, but I don't know. What happened in the end? What did I miss in the 80s that that turned this into a provocative situation? I mean, why, why was this a secret weapon? Why was Andre looking like this? <laughs> Andre was selling it. It was awesome. But still, so, it, just the ending doesn't make any sense. You're right. 
Like I, I didn't understand. I was happy for Hogan and Savage to win, obviously, yeah, of course, because, because uh, DiBiase and Andre were screwing them all over. Not that way, but um, <laughs> it, it felt it's contrived. Me, <laughs> it felt contrived. And I, I don't like contrived finishes. Like the more you have to do in terms of smoke and mirrors, the less I'm gonna like it. Mm -hmm. Gordon, I agree. Um, good match, uh, despite you know Andre being uh, going downhill. Um, but two things. First of all, um, as strange as it may sound, Savage has one of the strongest stares I've ever seen. I, like I, I was sitting at home and got afraid because it's it's that powerful. And the second thing is, I shall always connect this match with the uh, WWF Superstars Arcade in which Andre and DiBiase are the finalists. I just thought about that game and I've just thought about the interview with me and Jenny where goes like, no one can beat million mega bucks. And then Dan DiBiase says, I'm going to beat you with my million dollar dream. That was just, at the, I'm, I'm, I'm serious, it's a classic. I'm, I, I love that game. I just how love it. How couldn't they get voice clips of the original wrestlers though? Like, you're a licensee? We don't want to pay though. <laughs> we just own the characters. We don't want to pay that DiBiase to do voiceovers. Yeah. It's like when uh, Legion of Doom didn't do the in the sequel, the WrestleFest. They didn't do the WrestleFest. Yeah, we snack on danger, dine on, dine death. on death. Still, also awesome game. There was a, uh, I think it was a sequel in uh, one of the Android phones or something to WrestleFest, yeah. but it wasn't really good. Mm -hmm. Actually, got canceled after a couple of months. But now we have Retro Fest, WrestleMania, Retro Mania Wrestling, which is pretty good. Pretty good. It's not mm -hmm. there yet, but it's pretty good. I recommend it. It's getting there. I remember yeah. WrestleFest and Superstars being such quarter munchers back in the day. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Damn. Those were, were an expensive hobby. Too much, man. Arcades yeah. took a lot out of me. They took, they took, they probably took a mortgage out of my life. Yeah. Back in the day. Like today, you can play on the PC. It's not much of a challenge yeah. to find the, the a good the, emulator the, on online. Even you can go into a website has a yeah. special emulator online, and then you can just play the games, which is awesome. Oh, mm -hmm. the money spent. <laughs> yeah, I remember spending most of my allowance on Pac-Man and Donkey Kong back in the day. I was more of a Capcom kind of guy, like Cadillacs and Dinosaurs, Final Fight, Street Fighter, all that kind of stuff. Well, Captain things. America, the Avengers, X-Men. Those weren't going to exist for another 15 years at the time. Why? They were, they were in the 80s, right? 89 and 90. Yeah, but the other one was 81 and 82. Before I was yeah. born. Yeah, exactly. And I was, a, <laughs> I was a really, really little kid back in the day. Uh, well, local... we expect you to be in born in a, in a better time period. <laughs> Still. Well, you you probably grew up with a new generation, right? Um, did you? No, no. Look, look, look. When I came to wrestling, when I started being a fan, it was 1993. Oh yeah. So yeah. it's it's not it's not exactly the new generation yet, but it's it's getting there. It's 1994, so it's a year afterwards. I started wrestling, uh, watching wrestling actually back in 1987. I was four years old. My earliest memory of watching wrestling, and I'm totally, I'm totally like bodging this. It was a cage match between Bruiser Brody and one of the Von Erichs. It's, it's, it never happened. It were totally different people. That's just the image that's stuck in my head of me eating a burger ranch at home. It's a burger. Uh, watching that on in Middle Eastern television. And that was when I was four years old. Afterwards, we didn't have any cables, and then we got like, uh, we call it piracy cables. So someone puts a couple of uh, wrestling uh, videos online of Hogan and Andre fighting in one of the main events. And from there, it just jumps into 92 when I had cable, and I saw the whole Survivor Series 92 build up, which I talked about in length in Hebrew with Gordon a couple of weeks ago. So mm -hmm. yeah, I'm from 92, basically. 87, 92, yeah. Did you ever figure out who was actually in that match? The Bruiser Brody character? No, match? just an image in my head, but still, I like that image, so I don't care. <laughs> that would have been an awesome match, though. It would be an awesome match, but it never happened. <laughs> well, for good reason. Yeah. Because neither, neither guy would put the other over. <laughs> <laughs> I just remember a one time back in Middle Eastern television, back like in the late 90s, someone decided to air World Class Championship Wrestling. So I started watching it. And I saw all these, all these characters, the Zamboi Express and Bruiser Brody fighting uh, Hitman Dan Patterson. And 
a guy who was not, now known as Tugboat in his earlier name, uh, I think Big Bubba? Could be? He was. Uh, yes. Yeah, so he was wearing a weight, weightlifting belt and then the Bruiser attacked him and then he changed to street clothes. It was awesome. <laughs> I just love watching that. So, yeah. That's going back a long time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. A little bit. So, that was SummerSlam 88. And as always, we give a score between 1 till 10. And it was, it was even a 0 if the show was a complete catastrophe. So, Oliver, we're going to start with you. What is your score for SummerSlam 88? I thought it was a 6, personally. I didn't think it was a 10 or a 9 or an 8. But um, I, did, I do remember three matches very fondly from that pay-per-view. And... That's more than I can say about many of the pay-per-views that came afterwards. So I want to stick with a six because it was a little bit better than average, but it had a lot of filler programming on, and I didn't really enjoy the filler matches very much. How about you guys? Gordon? I'll go the extra mile and give it six and a half. Oh. Uh, yeah, because basically, even if it wasn't good wrestling, uh, which they showed here, it was um, good storytelling. And that, that, that should be enough for me, which it is. I'll go with uh, Oliver on this. I'm going to give it a six. Good pay-per-view. A very nice pay-per-view. Wasn't very memorable in, like, match quality-wise, but instead of a couple of matches during the entire pay-per-view, like, you could say the opening was probably one of the best matches on the card, even though it was a 20-minute uh, time limit draw. The memorable moment of the Warrior winning the championship against the Honky Tonk Man, which was very memorable. And, you know, you got that main event <laughs> and the whole skirt thing. So that, that thing happened. But overall, it was a very nice evening of wrestling. I enjoyed it. it well, I was, I'm not going to leave it on a sour note. So, yeah, I'm going to give it a 6 out of 10. Wow. So, pretty much all on the same page here. Yeah, pretty much. Except for Gordon yeah. to give it a, a half a point more. Yeah. So good for him. Good for Gordon. Doesn't Gordon Good for you, Gordon, be more positive on on, yes, on pay-per-views of yesteryears and stuff. Yeah, well, I tried. I was gonna say, I was gonna say, Gordon usually comes in a little bit under you. The he? radar, yeah. yeah. Still, I tried my best this time around. <laughs> it, it's okay. still, one, it's still one of my more memorable pay-per-views personally, which is why mm -hmm. I requested it, just because uh, of yeah. that one moment with Warrior and Honky, and it wasn't a great match or anything, but it's still something. If I think back to the 80s WWF, it's one of those moments that just immediately pops into my mind. It's a good moment. It is. Yeah. Well, we're still deliberating about the next pay-per-view we're going to review, but there's so many options. If you want to maybe suggest anything we, we would like to us to review, let us, uh, leave, us a comment, leave us a comment in the comment section. And that is our review. Now we would like to hear from you. Let us know in the comments below. Do you agree with our decision? Do you think... SummerSlam 88 was a good pay-per-view or was it a pay-per-view we should have uh, passed on entirely? So let us know in the comments below. And also, if you want to stay notified when we're uploading these episodes, hit a like, subscribe to our channel, and hit that bell notification button. And we'll see you next time on another Clothesline Retro Review. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time.